Hola, eh, buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Very welcome all the people that uh, are on the screening. Eh, estamos eh, pues, eh, muy contentos de seguir con la programación de este Festival de Arquitectura y Ciudad Mextrópoli. Ya el día de ayer tuvimos eh, unas conferencias extraordinarias de Nacho Sabal de Ascoa, de Iñaki Alday, de Teresa Moller. Eh, y esta mañana hemos tenido oportunidad de inaugurar eh, nueve de los pabellones eh, de este festival, en este caso en el Conjunto Cultural de los Pinos en la Ciudad de México, para celebrar una ciudad extraordinaria, para festejar la ciudad, para convertir la arquitectura como parte de la cultura necesaria eh, para ir pensando generación tras generación, cómo queremos vivir en nuestras ciudades. Eh, ahora vamos a tener eh, eh, una conferencia de Hashim Sarkis, eh, en este caso la única que es exclusivamente eh, virtual en streaming, él desde Boston, nosotros aquí en la Ciudad de México, eh, y abierto para todos ustedes como parte del Festival de Arquitectura y Ciudad Mextrópoli. Hashim Sarkis es decano de la Escuela de Arquitectura y Planeación del Instituto Tecnológico de Massachusetts, el MIT, y pues eh, sobre todo, y por eso este, está aquí con nosotros, es curador de la 17 ava Bienal de Arquitectura de Venecia. Este año eh, Hashim Sarkis eh, planteaba el cómo queremos vivir o cómo, cómo podemos vivir juntos en, en, en nuestro planeta, un planeta cada vez más eh, urbano, un planeta ya mayoritariamente urbano, eh, y en el que esta eh, pregunta no está de más, pero sí incorpora eh, un nuevo factor. Este, este tema nos lo veníamos planteando desde hace tiempo, se había planteado sesgadamente o con otros enunciados en algunas bienales anteriores, pero yo diría que el factor... Eh, central de la pregunta que propone Hashim Sarkis es esa condición eh, planetaria, es decir, la pregunta que nos hacemos ya no es local, ya no es cómo queremos vivir algunos en alguna que otra ciudad o cómo queremos vivir de un modo particular eh, desde alguna perspectiva vinculada a la sostenibilidad o, o, algún, o algún aspecto específico, sino que lo que plantea eh, tiene una trascendencia global. Ya son discusiones que en, en este planeta urbano debemos tener entre todos porque eh, ya sería casi, no sé si irrelevante, pero con poco efectivo cualquier determinación que tuviéramos solo a nivel eh, local. Eh, en ese sentido, ese cambio de escala eh, plantea un nuevo paradigma y pues en buena medida para eso estamos con eh, Hashim el día de hoy. Eh, very welcome, eh, Hashim. We are very pleased that uh, we could have this talk uh, with you and uh, and it will be a pleasure to to listen to your your talk. And and at the beginning uh, and at the end, uh, we uh, I also will be very pleased to, to invite our common friend Daniel Dao to to share with us some questions about your ideas. Very welcome. Thank you. Thanks a lot for hosting me. And thanks a lot for inviting me to Mextropoli. I am honored to be among old friends and new. And uh, in celebration of this uh, occasion, I just wanted to share with you that uh, this is the first time I give this talk. This is the first time I actually present uh, not so much the theme, and the curation of the Biennale, but its design. And uh, my hope is to show that an exhibition about architecture, the architecture of an architectural exhibition, uh, does involve, uh, to a great extent, thinking about the designs of the spaces and that there's a very integral relationship between the curation and the design. And that it is not a one-way process from working out the theme first and then getting into the design of the exhibition, but it's actually an ongoing tension, exchange, challenge uh, on the relationship between the two. And along the way, it does reveal a lot about uh, how does one exhibit architecture? How does one present it? And how does one experience it? Not just in the form of an exhibition, but in the form of architecture. And I will be working 
today to highlight a few uh, challenges and linking them from the specific challenges of the space to the thematic of the exhibition. I am actually uh, very delighted to have Danielle uh, here to see an old friend, but also to have Danielle complement this presentation with reflections on the thematic of the exhibition as well. So that will allow us to have a discussion that links the two even more strongly at the end. I'm going to begin to share, and I will do my best to speak for maybe 35, 40 minutes, and then leave the rest for discussion. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Let me try again. So it's saying, choose what to share. Entire screen. OK, now it's going. Vamos a ver si se puede reconectar. Okay. You are back. I'm back and I'm going to try and share again. It's not letting me share for some reason. Okay. Let me try to share window. In which case, I would choose my yes. Chair. chair window. And now? I'm saying share window. I'm saying share the Microsoft PowerPoint. And I'm going to share. And it immediately tells me it has lost permission to capture your screen. Should, should be that way. I have to go to security and privacy and make sure that the browser is checked. One second. Is it under system preferences? settings okay yes that's the way you must give the streamyard app permission to share your desktop Bueno, lo que se acaba de conectar, eh, este, los invito a que visiten las exposiciones que ya están eh, abiertas. Eh, la de Alonso de Garay en, en, San, en, este, en el Museo Franz Mayer. Ah, ya. Yeah. That's okay, Hashim. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. Can you see it, see it now? Yes, yes, yes. It works. You, you can see the full screen. Yes. Okay, fantastic. So can you please uh, share me with the world? Am I there? Yes, you, you are there. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic, okay. Let me start. So what does it mean to have an architecture of an architecture biennale? The focus 
of my presentation will be on designing the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale, which is currently on show until the end of November, a process which started in 2018. I'm going to highlight a few major challenges. The first is really the size and the scale of the Venice Biennale. Many of you might have seen it already, but for those who haven't, uh, this map highlights the map of the city of Venice, and in yellow, the two sites, three sites actually, where the Biennale takes place. The historical Giardini, which were the grounds since the 19th century of the Art Biennale and subsequently the Art Tetra Biennale, and then the Arsenale, which slowly was added to the spaces, the venues of the Biennale. Additionally, there's a new site, which is the Forte Marghera on the mainland in Mestre, which is a very large park given by the city of Mestre to Venice, to the Biennale, to add uh, installations there. So confronted with this kind of scale, and just to present it to you here in terms of dimensions, there are about 10,000 square feet of, uh, sorry, 10,000 square meters of space to fill. And in uh, addition to that, there are the grounds. You can see the length of the arsenale here. Are you able to see my cursor when I move it? Yeah. Uh, you can see the length of the uh, corderia here. And then in the foreground on the bottom right, the uh, grounds of the Giardini. The first question I asked when I was appointed curator is whether we could reduce the scale of the Biennale. In previous visits, especially when I was president of the jury in 2016 in the Alejandro Aravena Biennale, I always felt like the space was exhaustive. Its expanse was uh, too much for one visitor to see in one eye, in one experience. Uh, but the response from the Biennale was, Hashem, give it a month and you will be asking us for more space. And indeed, they were right. A Biennale is not just an exhibition. It is a capture of the world at that particular moment. And therefore, its expanse, its scale, its size is necessary for uh, taking on the role of the Biennale. And yet there is a tension between that size and the experience that people have, particularly because of the two distant sites from each other and how does one capture them in one experience. And even more than that, the necessity to be able to carry the theme throughout without it losing its limits of elasticity. So from the get-go uh, with the curatorial team and with the Venice team, we uh, confronted the question of the size. There were many ways one could go about it, but uh, just to give you the lay of the land, uh, this is the building of the Corderia, which is the old rope factory of the Navy Yards uh, from the Renaissance, along with the open grounds where one could add installations. And the building has not just length, but it has muscle, it has history, it has also resistance to anything that takes place inside it. And the length can be actually extremely uh, overwhelming in the sense that it draws you through and that whatever you display in it uh, takes away from the uh, presence of the individual projects. In the Giardini, there's the much more conventional grounds of an international fair with the central pavilion in the end and an axis that leads to it and the grounds. But here again, in this conventional space, you do have uh, a kind of fragmented experience that necessarily requires something to put it together. And then you have the site of the Forte Marghera where if it doesn't have its own identity and thematic, it becomes very difficult to draw it back in. We built the model of each of these in the studio in Cambridge in order to first fathom the nature of the spaces and then begin to experiment with particular layouts inside these different spaces. Now, the theme happened along the same time. In a way, it wasn't that difficult to come up with the theme, but it was more challenging to turn the theme into an exhibition. The theme, as Miguel presented it, is how will we live together? And in developing the theme, it was divided into five scales, from the scale of the human body in relationship to other species, to the scale of the household, to the scale of the community, to the scale of territory, looking across political borders to address environmental issues and social issues. And then 
finally to the scale of the planet, which Miguel emphasizes being a dimension of this Biennale that is indeed new. It quickly, the organization of the exhibition into five scales helped tame the space of the exhibition. In the sense that we managed to take two scales, the as one planet and across borders, put them in the Giardini, and the three other scales put them in the Arsenale. So one's experience of each of these venues could be complete, uh, or at least partial, partially complete in relationship to the general thematic. And that you could, in the space of time that is available for you, because for, you cannot see the whole thing in less than one day, uh, you will be able to have a com comprehensive consummatory experience of one of those five scales. And scale is something that we think with as architects. And the confrontation with the scale of the exhibition became something also that preoccupied the graphic designer team. And this is a group between New York, uh, Portland, Oregon, and LA called Omnivore. We're lucky to be working with them, who quickly understood the challenge of scale and started using it to organize the graphics of the exhibition. And so you see here, for example, on the left, how the scalar shift of the titles informs the experience of the viewer as they come in into the exhibition. They also developed a series of textures and colors that became the coding for the experience of the exhibition and a kind of soft guide as you move through from one section of the exhibition to the other. So in a way, scale became the tool to tame the size. But scale, in a way, gave us another challenge, but maybe another opportunity also to be able to work out the relationship with the space, particularly with the muscular arsenale uh, Corderia, that uh, made the scalar confrontation a very uh, a fertile one in relationship to the space. As we moved in the Arsenale, in the Corderia, from the scale of the human body to the scale of the household to the scale of the community, the nature of the display changed. When it came to the human body, as in this image, the scale was one to one. You were almost walking among mannequins. Uh, one-to-one -one scale objects that made the experience very visceral, very corporeal. Uh, whereas when you move to the scale of the household, we tried, given the size of the room, 14 meter high ceilings, 20 meter wide spaces, to confront the space with one-to-one -one models of houses. So it is as if it is a street of houses that you're walking through. And then when it came to the scale of the community, which is when the facilities that you're displaying, whether they are neighborhoods or schools or hospitals became bigger, we resorted back to more conventional architectural representation of scale of models of uh, fragmentary models, which allowed a kind of different level of familiarity with the nature of the display in this exhibition. In a way, this exhibition, because of its even broader expanse, more horizontal expanse towards the scale of the body on one side and to the scale of the planet on the other, included a broader range of representation than your regular conventional biennales, which usually stayed between the scale of the architecture and the scale of the city. And therefore, the scalar representation of these different scales of experience uh, entailed some innovation and experimentation with the scale of the architectural uh, installations themselves. We took this challenge of scale a bit further because even though we are dealing with five scales, the arsenale itself is divided into more than three rooms, for example, to accommodate for the five for the three scales that are in it. And the Giardini has a series of rooms which again do not correspond to just two spaces or two sections. And therefore we use the room logic of the existing buildings as a way to organize subthemes in every scale in order to allow even for a further dialogue among the projects that are displayed. So just to give you one example, in the section among diverse beings, we divided it into two rooms. And in the second room, there is a space called living with other beings, which explores how we need to accept and confront and accommodate the presence of other beings, birds, bees, microbiomes, fungi, in the space of architecture. And here, this room becomes a dialogue among these different projects and the different approaches by architects from all around the world in dealing with this question. 
So when you enter a room, you're entering within the space of the theme that you're in or the scale that you're in, a dialogue among different projects that create a polemic that then you can participate in as a viewer. We also introduce something else. Most of the binaries are either project oriented or analytical, research oriented, or they tend to separate the two from each other if they coexist in the same exhibition. We opted to introduce research as kind of in-depth analysis of some of the thematics that you're looking at in the form of stations that punctuate the rhythm of the Biennale so that you can really stop, take a break, look in depth at data uh, information, historical information that help you understand better the scale and the theme you're at. And then you get out and then you continue into the project spaces. And so that created another rhythm, another cadence and break of the size uh, through this creation of these stations. But the two buildings, the Giardini and the Arsenale Corderia confronted us with a very different set of problems when it came to the planning, to the actual layout of the spaces. And here, again, we sat down and started looking at the very nature of the layout of the spaces. The Corderia, which is a 300 meter long building, was that long in order to allow for making ropes. But the length is also organized into a nave and aisles, the kind of very axial centralized planning. And if you follow the logic of that to become the logic of circulation in the space, you risk to push the projects to the two sides and keep circulation in the middle and therefore compromising the presence of the projects towards the power of the Corderia itself. So we wanted to move away from this kind of axial nave aisles logic uh, with, with a different logic. And so we started experimenting with different layouts. And here again, we tested different possibilities of how the Corderia itself can be treated as a free plan space where the columns are not axial, but more like pilotis in a free plan. And where every now and then the space is confronted with a very large installation that breaks it down, that brings it down to the scale of architecture of a house, architecture of one big experience that allows the display to be much more present, to much, be much more powerful. And from the beginning, we also tried not to respect the continuity of the axis and every now and then give in to it because of the convenience of that in arranging some projects, but not letting that overwhelm the display. And in some cases, we even took over the columns in order to allow the architecture to be present. And in some other cases, the contrast between the two natures, the two structures of space uh, became part of the display itself. And this is a case of Pejual uh, project where it uh, becomes a free plan, a kind of field of experiences within the axial arrangement. And this is just an overall layout of the display where you can see a kind of uh, freedom of layout, where every now and then the central axis takes over, but in general it is punctuated and broken by large installations that kind of confirm the groupings of the rooms and the sub-themes. The Giardini had a different problem. The Giardini is much more of an enfilade, uh, where you connect rooms through doorways, mostly on axis, in relationship with each other, and uh, really respecting the axiality of the organization of the garden from the outside. Uh, some curators before have tried to close some of the doors, and it's much easier to close doors here than in the Arsenale, which is very much protected by historical regulation, historic preservation regulations. Uh, so curators have closed a lot of doors here in order to organize the movement in a linear way. But uh, because we had the clarity of the two scales, the global scale, the planetary scale and the territorial scale, which are here located in order to contrast the Giardini building and the Giardini uh, logic of national pavilions with other ways of organizing the world as one planet and also across borders, across political borders to challenge the 
conventional understanding of the Biennale as being made out of national pavilions. We opted here to maintain the axiality, but to multiply it so that it would allow you for a much more diffused experience of the space if all the doors opened and even more doors were opened, where every room gets bisected by two axes almost to make the circulation much more fluid and much more open. And here you have the main room in the, uh, in the central pavilion where we opened all four doors and even connected to the upper level. And I will come back to that connection as a separate problem that we tried to address in the design of the space. But here you have the final layout of the Giardini where the axiality coming in from the main door through the central dome to the main space is completely open all the way to the back. And then every room has a double axis uh, for the most part in order to diffuse the circulation and allow you to move and make connections between the different pieces across. It's in a way much more sure, more certain here that you could grasp the scale of each first because the building is smaller, but because the connection between the two sides also is more blurred. And therefore you're able to kind of enhance that diffusion with the diffusion of the space. The buildings of the Giardini and the Arsenal do not only have history, but they have the ghosts of past architects and people who have built them that are very present. And they solicit some response. To paraphrase from the first curator of the first architecture Biennale, Paolo Portuguesi, the presence of the past is very strong in the Biennale. And it's not just the presence of historical artifacts, but also the presence of hands, strong hands like Carlos Calpa and Sansovino and others who have shaped the spaces and left a few relics that you have to deal with. Uh, if you go around the grounds of the Giardini, for example, the presence of Carlos Carpa is very, very strong. The old ticket booth, uh, some windows, leftovers of staircases are still there. And even though they are mostly abandoned, they are still kept as relics of uh, Scarpa's oeuvre, and they're very powerful and present in the spaces. Obviously, there is this space, which is the famous canopy garden entrance to the library in the Giardini, which some curators have chosen to do something with, but uh, maybe out of deference, maybe out of avoiding the challenge, I left it completely open. I left it completely empty. But uh, Scarpa's presence uh, was always evoked uh, in relationship to the upper level space on the main axis uh, because he had, when he was designing the architecture for the Art Biennale, uh, built a staircase, which was a kind of multi-level staircase that led you up this axis in a non-linear way. And uh, it stayed there for a while, but then afterwards it was removed and only leftover pieces of it still remain hidden in the partitions everywhere. And in designing the open axis, as I mentioned, we wanted to connect the axiality of the spaces all together. We were faced with the challenge of how do you go from the dome to the main space to the level above, which is the platform uh, which exists above the main space. It's a mezzanine kind of, uh, without having to go through the kind of circuitous route to the back and come up on the, from the back door, which is a rather uh, backdoor kind of way of entering into a major space. We also wanted to put on that platform an exhibition, which is a kind of mini Biennale, where a group uh, led by six luminaries from around the world, including Mary Robinson, uh, Olafur Eliasson, Caroline Jones, Mariana Mazzucato, who uh, proposed an idea of a mini United Nations or an expanded United Nations called the Future Assembly, where they invited all of the participants at the Biennale each to suggest an item which is non-human. It could be a phenomenon from the atmosphere. It could be a river, a mountain that in their mind should be included in the organization of the future UN National Assembly. It is in a way another response thematically to the presence of national pavilions and the organization of the Biennale around nation states and creating a new collectivity 
uh, in the Biennale itself. After all, the Biennale is a United Nations, but here, as we confront the questions of climate change, of a very different understanding of our own presence in the world, we opted to create this idea of a future assembly. But how to get there was the main challenge. If we want to give it that prominence, how to get there? Initially, it started designing big staircases. Staircases were become more like bleachers for people to gather around. But quickly it became clear that the space was small and an element like this would actually be challenging the other pieces around it, the architectural uh, propositions of the participants. So we moved away from this kind of very axial continuation of the uh, Giardini uh, main concourse. And here you see how it confronts the pieces in terms of scale and becomes too present to a piece that was pushed against the wall, almost an homage to Scarpa, but uh, because of the sub levels, but in a kind of compacted space that creates a labyrinth of experiences of separating from your partners as you're walking up the stairs and then connecting again, encountering strangers and having different points of view. So a kind of experience of how will we live together as we go up and down staircases. And it was pushed back and painted white to sort of disappear in the space of the room. And occasionally you see a head peering and another person going around it. And that became a kind of return to continuity between below and above, return to creation of a stepped uh, transition from the lower level to the upper level, the way that Scarpa thought about it. But one that was more compressed as a kind of vertical labyrinth in order to allow for the architecture of the installations to be more present than the architecture of the curator. Another major specter is the presence of this amazing potential of space, which is the Gajandri, a covered water area outside in the gardens of the, in the, in the grounds of the uh, Arsenale, where many curators have attempted to put something there. Many other curators have understandably abandoned that because it's such a powerful space, such a powerful structure that it's very difficult to deal with it. And we tried with many participants to try to build an installation around or in this space. And finally, we had a special project with the foundation, the Vuslat Foundation, who invited Giuseppe Penoni to create a tree for listening, connecting between us and nature and the sky. Uh, where Penoni very smartly avoided putting this tree inside the uh, Gachandre, but kept it outside and emphasized its fragility in connection to the Gachandre in a very beautiful and powerful way, uh, allowing a kind of tension between the strength of the architecture and the fragility of nature as, it, as they confront each other. A third and last example of this confrontation with past specters is the presence of the main pavilion dome, which is uh, one of the few leftover pieces of the original building of the uh, 19th century uh, Biennale. And here again, uh, past curators have either covered it, blocked it off, or just let you pass underneath it and left it intact. In this particular case, we experimented with different ideas until we ended up inviting Cape Bureau, uh, a group from Nairobi, uh, to create an installation which is a, a part of a proposal, a project, I'll come back to it at the end, uh, but also a replica of the first known inhabited cave, uh, which becomes a contrasted dome underneath the dome, made out of individual pieces of obsidian stone hanging from the ceiling. And so, in this particular case, it was a much more, a much stronger confrontation between the original architecture of the 19th century pavilion and the contemporary installation. One challenge that every curator faces in designing the Biennale experience is to design the facade of the main pavilion in the Giardini. And this is a facade that is kind of a remnant of many iterations, many versions of the uh, past facades. 
uh, reduced right now to four aesthetic white columns and uh, apps, and then it says La Biennale above. Uh, in 19, in, sorry, in 2020, uh, the Biennale held a collective archival exhibition called The Disquieted Muses, where uh, a design group working with the five curators, but primarily with uh, Cecilia Alemani, who's now the curator of the art exhibition, uh, decided to create this installation around the facade of the main pavilion, pulling out from the past pieces that were there before and have been washed away over the years. If you think about it, the Giardini is a display of national pavilions, and every pavilion, in a very exaggerated way, presents its national identity, whatever it is at that time, in the facade. So even though it's not until 1980 that there was an architecture biennale, these facades, in architectural terms and with architectural means, uh, presented architecture as a means of expressing national identities. And here you have a kind of uh, collage of different versions of the main pavilion, which was the Italian pavilion for the longest time, and showing the evolution of this pavilion from these exaggerated national identities into a, a subdued white facade. In the earlier stages of, curate, of thinking about how do we design this facade, I wanted the facade to go away, especially the four columns, which have a kind of, how does one call it? A kind of autocratic presence without naming names. And taking away from that would require a lot of funding, a lot of money spent. And as curator, you have to decide how much money you spend yourself and how much money you allocate to the participants. And Initially, you're ambitious, and here we wanted to cover the columns with mirrors and create a huge mirror from ground to ceiling, which is kind of faceted mirror that would reflect the sky, would bring nature in. And as you're arriving, you see yourself as being the we in how will we live together, and then you enter the experience of the Binali. But the budget was huge for this, and uh, even though we wanted to raise money, the realities of the pandemic hit us very strongly. And uh, most of the money that were allocated for the uh, curatorial interventions, I gave to the participants so that they can continue to uh, build their installations. Uh, and at some point, I accepted the possibility that this bare facade, white on white on white, will be all we have to receive people. After all, it was reflective in a way of the times we were in. But thought maybe that we can add to that the poster or the title of the poster. And here, uh, it's the very power of those graphics that uh, Omnivore created for the Biennale uh, that inspired us to do something different. Uh, just to stop to talk about the graphics for a little bit, uh, what Omnivore provided us was a poster that was almost in the making. Every image is slightly different. Every display is slightly different. But they all have this feeling that things are moving in them. Nested houses or semblances of houses uh, connected to human being cutouts overlaid with transparencies of other creatures, of stars, of uh, seas, of planetary scales, all combined into this mix that is in the making. And therefore, there was something about it that was always leaving you looking at it. And even they introduced for the first time, I think, in a Biennale, an animated poster, where when you go to the airport as you arrive in Venice, there's an animation of this poster, which shows truly that it is happening. It's in the making. These creatures are assembling and reassembling in order to think about ways they can get together, they can live together. So we came back to looking at the graphics of the five scales and saying, okay, how can we make a poster just on the facade out of this? And then decided that perhaps the mirror can come back in a smaller scale as the backdrop with this vinyl, with the graphics as vinyl translucent over it. But importantly, because the mirror is there, we can remove the human features from there, the human figures from there and turn it into more of a continuous mirror with a series of cutouts where when you arrive, and we reduce the scale, when you arrive, 
it's almost like you're entering the poster. You are the human presence in this poster before you go in. And these facades are always the kind of selfie moment, the moment where you take a picture of yourself with the Biennale to say, I was there. And so why not, instead of flipping your camera around on your phone, have the mirror there so that you don't need to do that. It's a selfie by you being part of the poster. And we installed it at the height of the door so that it's like a continuous panoramic cut behind the columns. It's as if there was a garden behind the facade that you entered into. And here we are, yours truly taking a selfie with friends. Uh, this is Ala Tanir, the editor of the publications, uh, taking it to another level with an emoji and a friend. Here's me again with my wife on the left and with Alejandro Ravenna and Manuela Lucadazio from the Biennale on the right. And here you have people arriving, taking selfies before they go in. One very funny story happened is that after we set it up, I get a call from Venice saying, the facade has a problem. It is being attacked by seagulls. And apparently seagulls, when they see themselves in the mirror, they think it's another bird and they attack it. Luckily, we had uh, used aluminum sheets instead of glass, so the aluminum was intact. We're still waiting for them to attack again to take pictures so that we can use it as an example of how we live together with other beings or not so well after all. I want to quickly now take you through the idea of an exhibition as an expanded experience, meaning the exhibition not simply as a representation of architecture, but as an experience of architecture, which is a dimension that we have emphasized in our discussions with the participants. So that in this day and age of digital access to everything, where you can Google a building and you get gets plans, sections, elevations, and views, uh, displaying those alone in an exhibition is no longer sufficient. And therefore, this exhibition had to create a heightened experiential dimension with light, sound, smell sometimes that allowed you to be holistically engaged in the experience of the architecture. But importantly, that this experiential dimension uh, took this idea of a very different understanding of who we are as beings in this world to another dimension. Importantly, I have to share with you that the demographics of previous Biennales show that more than 50% of people who visit the architecture Biennale are not architects. And therefore, there has to be a level of accessibility for this Biennale to the rest of the world in a way that is beyond architects speaking about architecture to architects. Thus, the title, a simple question, which is open-ended. Thus, the kind of projects that have been selected and thus the man manner in which they are displayed. I, in the remaining time I have, I will present it to you from the experience of setting up the exhibition to the experience of the exhibition itself, all the way to the present as a quick chronology. Uh, beginning in the summer of 2019, after the theme was developed, we started doing a series of workshops, myself and the uh, assistant curators, uh, Julio Binjaku as a researcher, and the assistant curators, uh, uh, Roy Salguero and Gabriel Koslovsky, along with Ala Tanir, who's the managing director of the publications, with a group of MIT students uh, on the thematic itself, trying to develop beyond the projects themselves, certain ideas and thoughts about how Will we live together with the different dimensions of architecture? And then the fall of 2019, uh, some of the students came into the office to work with us on a kind of Venice lab, we called it, on the uh, design of the space and its layout. And we also worked with Omnivore and with the Venice team here visiting us in uh, my Cambridge office uh, on the further development of the project. Uh, the project, in a way, if you think about it in architecture terms, came halfway or even almost to the finish of design development when February 2020, it had to be postponed. First, it got postponed until August 2020, and then realizing that the pandemic was here to stay until May 2021. You all have experienced it one way or the other, uh, and we are still in the throes of it. But you can imagine that in the first few months, we just shut down. 
we didn't even think about the Biennale. We were more worried about our livelihood, our offices continuing, and many of the participants of the Biennale just shut down. And we kept in touch, and we kept in touch simply to find out how we're doing. And then once it became clear that there is a possibility of starting again, we restarted the discussion. And we restarted the discussion asking first how we're doing. Are you able to continue? Have you lost your donors? And many people did, and we had to start again. What can we do to help? We restarted fundraising. It was very challenging for people to believe that this thing will happen. But a few people believed in us, and they supported us. And we started creatively thinking about how we can streamline the process of uh, developing the projects, shipping them, uh, and some people revised their installations to address these challenges. But in general, most of the participants stayed with their projects and redesigned them simply to adjust to the pandemic public health requirements. And we all ultimately felt like the theme and the questions that it raised were still very pertinent, even more pertinent because of the pandemic. And ultimately, even though the exhibition was not about the pandemic, but it was about the causes of the pandemic. It was about climate change. It was about global migration, uh, growing economic inequalities, growing political polarization. And we felt like the pandemic may go away and hopefully it will go away very soon. But if we don't address these questions, then other crises will emerge. And in a way, we stayed the course, but adjusted maybe people's eyes adjusted more than we did in order to see it in line of this crisis as well. Uh, in preparation to the build-up towards May 2021, uh, the Biennale also organized a series of sneak peeks where every participant and every national participant were given uh, the opportunity to have a short video on the website of the Biennale to anticipate that. And that actually proved to be a very successful kind of build-up, cumulative build-up of uh, expectations for the Biennale opening in May. Uh, in thinking about the Biennale as well, we thought that both the projects, which usually, and the national pavilions, which are usually put together in a, in a catalog, uh, required further expansion, further elaboration through different eyes, because the question was so universal and broad that it required, at one level, research. And we produced a book a section in the exhibition called Cohabitats and the book called Cohabitats, where we asked different universities from around the world to show how the cities they're in uh, share this experience of living together in the kind of ingenuity of the citizens in inventing spaces for cohabitation. And then we invited a group of 80-something, mostly non-architects, in a book called Expansions, to uh, think about the question in very short essays, 500 words, 1,000 words, and the picture, uh, in order to help expand on the theme itself. And these two books uh, are published and they are now available and they were, they were released on the opening date along with the catalog. The cover of the book Expansions is by the Israeli-American artist Michal Rovner with an image that was, for me and ultimately for uh, the uh, graphic designers, the kind of beginning of the inspiration about the graphics of the, of the project. And then in March 2021, against all odds, we started the installation work. And here you see in the foreground the pieces of a project by uh, Alex Elion and uh, Lucio Marcel being installed. And then the kind of overwhelming perspective of the Arsenale. Uh, these are some of the boxes being shipped by some of the participants. And this was a very different approach. Many participants shipped. Some people on the other end, including the Biennale team, helped receive, rather than the former approach of people sending, bringing their stuff with them, installing them with their own contractors and leaving in a kind of individualized way. In order to help people, we raised money to build the local teams, local participation in volunteering to help from local students, and matching some of the local firms with American, European uh, firms that could not travel in order to make the installations happen. A lot of 3D printing happened in Venice. A lot of uh, printing of drawings and maps was done in Venice in order also to cut down on the costs of shipping, which became exorbitantly expensive during this period. Remember, against, in addition to all of the uh, pandemic crisis, there was also the Swiss Canal lockdown, 
which increase the challenges of shipping. Here are the Maid robots coming in uh, to start building their fungi structure. This is the Aravena building outside. A Philip Beasley's installation being put together. This is the Iris Mateus Brothers project on living together apart. Some of the installations outside in the gardens. Lisa Silva installing her staircases from Venezuela. This is the main stair being built. Snow being brought in from the mountains of Cortina to create an installation in the main room about protecting snow. Uh, just to give you some figures, in total there were 10,000 people involved in the organization of the Biennale. Uh, in general, this is a lower number than usual because many people were did not all travel together, but they either sent a representative or were represented by locals. But this does include the national pavilions and the countries. And even though today I'm not talking about the national pavilions, we could not separate these figures to show the uh, breakdown. But according to the organizers of the Venice Biennale, however, the pandemic has caused major changes in the organization and implementation process of the exhibition compared to previous editions. It has improved the environmental sustainability of the Biennale thanks to less presence in Venice of architects, their assistants, and foreign companies directly involved, therefore less traffic and less displacement, less carbon emissions. We are entrusting the installations construction to local companies, and therefore there's much more collaboration working together that has emerged as a result of that. And some of the site-specific installations, and there are quite a few this time, might actually be preserved and relocated in Venice therefore reducing the cost of uh, destruction, demolition, at the end of the uh, Biennale. On May 22, 2021, a week after Europe opened the borders miraculously to different countries, we opened the Biennale. Uh, the attendance was about two-thirds, what usually is the attendance at an opening. But uh, during that day, we opted not to have the jury because there were about five or six participants and five or six countries that had not finished their installation, but to postpone the jury, which is usually which happens at the opening. And instead, we only offered the uh, Golden Lion for Lifetime Achievements, which was given to Rafael Moneo. And uh, for the first time, this time, we also had an exhibition of the Golden Lion in the Giardini in the Sterling Pavilion. Open the doors. And here is the Peugeot Aletazi exhibition in the first room. And uh, I put this picture in, not just because it's really cute, but because actually there has been a higher percentage of families coming in with their children in this Biennale than previous ones. There's uh, Achim Menges's carbon fiber house one-to-one, -one, which again shows you the kind of confrontation with the Arsenale's bones. Thomas Saraceno's uh, balloon, the sarcophagus for extinct plants where you walk in and you can smell and you can see in the background the Carlos Carpa window. Dogma's installation in the Giardini. And this is the future assembly exhibition on the mezzanine floor uh, designed by SOS Group and Olafur Eliasson, which has all the different proposals from the different participants around the world in the exhibition about what should be added to the future assembly. The space of the brain, and this is the dome by uh, Kaburo in the uh, main dome. Lighting was used also to break down the impact of the Arsenale space. And here, just to give you a sense of the dialogue that emerges and the sub-themes, the tension between the different technologies, a technology covering the snow in order to protect it, and a technology embedded in the rock in order to absorb heat. And that's the main room seen from above. That's an installation outside, Hantumertik in a platform. Prosthetics of bodies, 
and Ilyu, Angelo Bucci's Circumference of the Earth, Inhabited Earth, Alan Wexler's Furniture Clothing Mix, This is one of the stations. Your restroom is a battleground, which looks at the history of bathrooms as spaces of battleground over gender and ethnicity. The main room again. The kind of Romeo and Juliet experience on the main stair. Elementals, Mapuche's Parley installation outside. Visual Otaz's models and doors. Nada's waiting area for the boats. And I end with Fernanda Canales' installation of houses uh, in the house section. Another dimension of this finale, which is now part of it, is we have taken the meetings on architecture and expanded it. It is a much more elaborate program. In a way, this lecture is part of it, of public engagement symposia that are taking place in the Biennale and will continue until end of November. The catalog, the program is online. And we're using a very hybrid model of online and, and in person to expand the outreach of the Biennale. We also did a collaboration with the Dance Biennale this year when McGregor brought some of the student choreographers to curate, to uh, orchestrate and choreograph dances around the installations. It was quite, quite an experience, beautiful dances. And then finally, August 2021, uh, the jury deliberations happened and the awards ceremony, which gave uh, awards to Ram Labor for their floating school, to a group of Palestinian Israeli artists and architects uh, working on a farm. They gave them a, a golden, sorry, a silver line for most promising new architecture, and Kaburo for their obsidian post Anthropocene project. Uh, got an honorable mention. Uh, just today, I got a message saying that September 25, 2021, there were 4,846 people who visited the 17th Venice Architecture Biennale. And so far, we know that more than 150,000 people have visited, surprisingly, to all of our, against all expectations, we have broken the record for the highest attendance of any Venice Architecture Biennale up to now by more than 16%. I leave you with this salute to the Mexican pavilion, which is truly sublime. And even though I did not talk about the national pavilions in this presentation, I cannot but uh, say thank you for the Mexican team for such a beautiful project. And thank you all for attending this lecture. A great, uh, Hashim, a great presentation and a great way to to visit with you virtually uh, the Biennale for all that uh, we could not visit this year. We tried, but uh, the COVID left out us just one day before to, to fly to, to Venice this year. Let, let, me, let me tell you that uh, we had a, a nice opening of an exhibition of uh, Rosana Montiel here in Mexico uh, two days ago. And uh, that was an opening uh, 18 months later than the first uh, projected opening, just two days before that we had to close everything because of the, of the COVID. And uh, during this time, uh, her exhibition in some way has grown or has had a kind of a maturity that uh, this time uh, where the exhibition was just closed uh, transform in some way the exhibition and make it uh, for me much more better. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, you're invited uh, uh, participants of uh, the Biennale have understood in some way also the, the, the past of the time. You are asking about the future, but the presence of this past that you mentioned of the, the first uh, Biennale, the Portuguese Biennale 
uh, do you think that uh, some of them have understood that and uh, it would be uh, in some way present uh, in, in, in the Biennale? Yeah. Uh, th thank you for this question because I, there's one dimension of this uh, year that we lost, the year of postponement, that was also a year that we gained. Uh, as you experience as architects as people who are involved in exhibitions we always rush towards the deadline we install and we look at it and say we wish we had more time if we had more time we would have done it differently and guess what this last year was also in some cases an added year we had more time both i as curator and the participants also had more time in being able to rethink their projects obviously we had less money but as architects, we also know that less money means a more refined project, a more sim a simpler project, mm -hmm. more parsimonious project, which in most cases means a better project. And so uh, I feel like this additional year has given us the possibility to uh, rethink uh, the nature of the architectural installation, but also uh, the connection between architecture and its material wealth or substance. And again, here, I would say that that has contributed in many ways to reducing the carbon footprint of this exhibition. Uh, I do have to say that the architects who were invited to this Biennale are relatively young. It's a much younger crowd than usual. And therefore, even though many of them have visited the Biennale, 90% of them have not exhibited in the Biennale before. Mm -hmm. And the aura of the Biennale was very present in their thinking, but not its history as much. And therefore, I don't feel like many of them were aware of the layers uh, that were before them there. I think that innocence might have helped in propelling this Biennale a little bit more towards the future. Uh, but there are some instances where there's a kind of wink, a reference to past Biennales. And there are, especially in the stations which reflect on the historical connections, uh, a lot of presence of the past Biennales. We have pulled out, for example, the flag of Rossi's Teatro del Mondo and put it there as a connection to the idea of the world in the world section, for example. And there are other winks and references to past penales that you have to find as you work your way through. Sounds great. Uh, Daniel, would you, would you like to have a comment? Thank you, Miguel. Uh, I actually have uh, one question, only one question, but I would like to pose it in three different ways, uh, and then I have a and then I have a closing question. I don't know how much time we have. I wouldn't want to miss uh, asking you. Um, so, the first question has to do with the um, with the idea of the synecdoche. The synecdoche is a literary form where a part stands in for the whole, yeah. and I'm, therefore I understand the that the Annale as, as, a, as a synecdoche, as a microcosmos, as a snapshot of the world. In that sense, I think many architecture biennials tend to be about the, the world of design, but this one in particular strikes me as, as one that is about the design of the world. Um, the, the first instance of my question is, um, you, you talked about Hashim, about the uh, spatial exercise, the design exercise, spatially, the challenges. I'm wondering what about the, the, the social exercise? How, I'm, I'm just remembering that your uh, PhD thesis eh, at the GSD was Publics and Architecture Reengaging Design in a Democracy. So how much of a dem democratic process was this you and, and the national pavilion curators, the other participants? What can you tell us about that in terms of how do we live together? The, the design of the biennial as a model for, for a democratic process of designing the world. Uh, let me try to answer it at different levels. Uh, you, you said you wanted to ask me the question in two different forms as well, two other forms. Should I take this one first and then address the other two? Okay. Uh, maybe, you answer, maybe you answer the other two forms right now. Okay. Uh, on the synecdoche, I think th this exhibition does include a lot of them. And I mean that in a literal way, because we wanted to exaggerate the experiential dimension of the architecture, not just its representation. Many of the architects were compelled to take a piece of their buildings and put it there. And therefore you enter into a piece of the structure. 
and that represents the whole in a very literal way. Uh, but there are also, I mean, especially when you're talking about the world and the exercise of the architecture imagination in relationship to a scale like that, there are also a lot of microcosms. There are a lot of allegories. There are a lot of uh, representations that try to miniaturize an experience that is otherwise much bigger or unfathomable. Uh, remember that architecture in, its, in relationship to its forms of representation is an allographic art. Meaning we don't usually produce the architecture, we produce representations of the architecture ahead of producing it. It's almost like music and the music sheet. And even though the music sheet is denotational, the architectural drawing and representations are connotational. And in that sense, there is a very uh, interesting continuity between a drawing, a model and the building, much more so than in the kind of arbitrary coded way of a music score and the music piece. Uh, in a way, these are not just representations, but rehearsals, preludes to architecture. And that I would add as being another form of representation beyond the synecdochal and the microcosmic, uh, is something like a prelude or the allographic. Right? Uh, in talking about how will we live together within the space of the Biennale itself, uh, let me just emphasize a few changes that happened. Uh, with the participation and help of the Biennale team, uh, this is the first time really that the names on the projects are not just the name of one author, but everybody involved. And that is not to diffuse authorship at all. This is to show the power of architecture as a synthetic art in being able to bring together different people with different skills and experiences uh, in a democratic way, but in a design synthetic way in order to be able to handle the complexities of the problems in front of us. The bigger the problems, the more we can deploy our skills as architects, as conveners, as custodians of the contract, uh, who are able to take input from different sources and synthesize them. And that doesn't mean that we should suppress those sources or ignore them. To the contrary, the more we're able to mobilize our skill to bring together different areas of expertise, the more powerful we are as architects. So I don't know if we want to take it to be democratic, but it's in the nature of the beast of design that we are generalists, conveners, and synthesizers. Uh, however, our democracy as citizens, not just as curators and participants, did play itself out very strongly in the Biennale because there was a lot of empathy among the different participants during this extra year. Not just the participants, but the national pavilions. I say that because we opened a dialogue uh, usually, I mean, if you think about the, uh, what can one call it, the anthropology of a Biennale, uh, it's in a, it happens in a very short period of time. And to make it happen, it has to be a dialogue between the curator and the participants. And it's almost a commission, a direct commission. In the beginning, it started like that. But this extra year turned this commission into a dialogue. And it became a dialogue not just between me, the curatorial team, and the participants, but among the participants themselves, trying to resolve some practical questions, but also trying to existentially start thinking about what do we do in this situation and how do we respond to this problem? And many group emails started, many WhatsApp groups started. And the beautiful thing, and even though the curator in the Biennale has a very distant relationship and organized by protocol between me and the National Pavilion uh, curators, a group emerged among the national curators uh, who wanted to create a platform for national dialogue so that they transcend the national boundaries in order to respond more adequately to the theme of how will we live together. And uh, they organized uh, conferences, they wrote a manifesto together, they also organized a competition which uh, produced a series of benches by students that were built uh, in the and hosted among them some of the national uh, pavilions. It was a truly moving transformation of the culture of competition into a culture of cooperation, partly as a result of this extra year that we have, but also partly in response to the, uh, to the theme. In a way, they rose to the occasion, they rose much higher than the occasion. And I, I, would, I would salute them uh, from here and say thank you for doing that. Uh, Hashim, uh, there is uh, uh, Maria Adriana Gebauer, she's asking, uh, what do you suggest that we can do from the local to the planetarian uh, scale? 
for one level, I, I feel like architecture can respond practically to some of the questions about, let's say, climate change. And let's reduce it right now to the question of climate change. We know that more than two thirds of carbon emissions are produced by architecture, mobility, and the, not just the construction, but the maintenance and inhabitation of buildings. Surely we can listen a little bit more to people who might have technical solutions for that and integrate them in our architecture, not as add-ons, but as integral parts of how we will build and live in these buildings from here on. That does require, again, the synthetic skills of the architect to be able to integrate all of this input together. So that's one thing we can do from the local to the planetary. But another thing that we do, and this is a kind of, uh, how do you say, emphasis across this whole Biennale, is to deploy the architectural imagination wherever we are in order to connect where we are, the spatial conditions, the spatial constraints where we're living with the planetary scale. Because it does require that leap of imagination for us to understand the gravity of this problem and the scale of this problem. And yet it's not very visible to us where we are. It rains hard, but that's about it. We see that. It floods, but we cannot connect it to a kind of planetary experience. It always connected locally. And therefore, the architectural imagination, which probably much more, which is stronger than any other imagination in seeing us, in allowing us to see the connection between the local and the global must be deployed here. And this is where this exhibition pushes the architectural imagination, meaning we alone can present what is possible, what could happen to the globe if, for example, uh, geoengineering happens. There's a whole installation by Design Earth in the Biennale about the world after geoengineering. We know that geoengineering solves some problems, but what is the holistic impact of that on the planet's future? We have that there. So there are many examples in this Biennale that try to address this question directly by the deployment of the architectural imaginary. That doesn't mean that we're going to be able through architecture to design the world. That would be uh, too megalomaniac. But what we can do is imagine the world. We ask what if the world can be otherwise and use it as a way to begin to orchestrate our actions towards a global transformation. Hashim, thank you. I think I think I have a chance for one more question. So um, I think a lot of us know you as an as an architect, as a, as a curator, but but mostly some of us know you as an educator, as a teacher. So my closing question would be what lessons learned for the future? What uh, advice would you give future curators of the Biennial? future curators of the Biennale. Okay. Well, I am very fortunate that that is not my problem. It is going to be theirs uh, to think about. Uh, let me just add that as part of the expanded program, as part of the different meetings on architecture, there will be one next week on refugees resettlement, one about the future assembly, one in November about uh, sustainability and climate change around the wholesome foundation awards one about generous listening with the Vuslat foundation but most importantly in relation to your question the very last one is called looking forward the education of the future architect and i'm bringing together different participants from around the world who have been engaged in pedagogy and the experimentation in pedagogy to talk about that because i truly believe not just as educator but as someone who's in the architecture world that we have to give that opportunity and that potential to the future generations. And if I have one piece of advice for future curators is to try to listen to the future architects in shaping the thematics and the ethos of the future Biennales. Uh, the Biennale is at once a, a section, a cross section to what is happening right now, but it's also a cross section of what the present is thinking about the future. And that is very important to maintain rather than simply to think about it as being a representation of architecture at its best today. Oh, okay. Uh, I think that uh, we, we, 
we, we spent all the time that, that, that we had. Uh, I have to thank, uh, we are very pleased, uh, Hashim, that uh, you could uh, share with us uh, your ideas and, and basically what happened with this, uh, this uh, difficult Biennale in some way. Uh, and uh, all, all, all the experiences that, uh, that you, you share in, in Venice. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you. All. you. And, uh, if thank I you. don't see you in Venice or in Boston, I will definitely see you in Mexico City soon. That would be great. Okay. And thank you, Daniel. Thank you all.